This is WRUULP Savannah, Georgia 107.5, and WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. Good evening. My name is Bill Cooper, and this is the inaugural event of my inaugural show. It's called Savannah at Night, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go on. But basically, I, I want to interview here in Savannah people that are involved with the arts. I do acting, and I do comedy, and I've met a lot of people in Savannah that are very talented, very good. And I want you listeners who may not take as much time as you, as you should to get out and see some of the good things happening in Savannah. Maybe we can encourage you to get out and see them because I, I am telling you, I am impressed with uh, how much there is going on in Savannah and that. Anyway, um, I'd like to introduce you my very first guest, and uh, I consider him a friend of mine too. Please welcome Rabbi Robert Haas, and he is the rabbi of Congregation Mikveh Israel here in Savannah. Hi, Robert. Hi, Bill. Thanks again for inviting me to join your program. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. I uh, met Robert doing stand-up comedy, and it's funny, as the old joke goes, a rabbi walks into a bar, and he did, <laughs> and everyone's kind of looking, and he signs up on the sheet, and he goes up, and he does comedy, and he was good. He, he slayed us, everyone in the crowd. I, I'll let you... I'll ask him a few things about that, but uh, it was uh, amazing how good he was and how comfortable he was doing it. And everyone welcomed him, and he's been part of our group, an unofficial group, but a group nonetheless of comedians that uh, work here in Savannah, in the Savannah area. So, Robert, I, I've been to church many a time, and I know either a priest or a minister will try to start off a sermon with a joke. And Do you do that, and is that how you kind of inspired yourself to the stand-up? A little bit, I think. What I enjoy about sermonizing is that you can make your jokes work with the sermon. I'm not the type of guy who likes to tell an internet joke, for instance, during a sermon. I like to tell jokes that work with the theme of the sermon and kind of work to help people really understand the meaning a little bit better. And that's, uh, that's what I enjoy doing. And I know, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking for someone who's listening to a sermon, it relaxes you when everyone in there has a laugh over something. They seem to relax and get ready for the message. That's, I think it's important. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, part of being a member of the clergy is to understand that people learn and understand in a variety of different ways. And if you use humor, not too little but not too much, it can really add a lot of depth and if you use a little humor in the middle and at the end a little bit, but really get your message across still, it can be much more comforting, and I think it works. Uh, it can be work very well. And as you know, humor can help people through tough times. I mean, this is a, this is a tough life we live, and there's a lot of things, good, good and bad, that happen to people. But if you have the ability to see the humor in something, you can get through the rocky times a, a little bit easier, I always felt. Yeah, and that's pretty much the theme of uh, Jewish humor in many respects. You know, so many of my ancestors lived in difficult times in Eastern Europe, and when they really started with what we call Yiddish writings and plays and really created what is, in many respects, modern comedy in the world, it was because of so many bad times and so many difficult times. So you made fun of yourself, you made fun of your enemies, you made fun of your situations, you made fun of the fact that you were powerless. So it kind of, you know, invigorated you, it empowered you. And so comedy, in many respects, was brought over to America uh, by, by a lot of Jewish immigrants. That's amazing. It's you can't even emphasize enough how hard, how horrible that was. But to, to be able to find something to keep you alive and give you hope, that you know, that shows how important it is. Comedy. You know, people will say, "Well, oh yeah, it's comedy," but and there's no comedy. But comedy is in everyday life. I don't know if you were like me. When I was a young kid, my my father was very funny. He could make anyone laugh. You met him. If you met him after one minute, you'd be laughing at something he said. He he just had that gift of comedy. And my mother had a good sense of humor, far different, though. But she pretty much was the disciplinarian. So I didn't mess around in the house. That was not my thing. However, I, and I, this is like a confession in school. Oh, the poor teachers. I just was, I was there 
not to learn, to, to see my friends and to, um, and to have a good time. I was class clown. It was everything George Collins said he was. <laughs> I, I was at that point. Now, here you are sitting across from me. As I say, I, I know you as a friend and I know you as a rabbi. How did you start out? I mean, when you first remember, as far back as you can remember, that you were able to make people laugh, how was it accepted? Well, I'm a little different. I'm a rabbi. I'm a member of the clergy. So in school, I always did exactly what my teachers told me to do. I always listened politely, sat there and studied nonstop, never gave my parents any trouble. <laughs> was pretty much what we would call the perfect child. And so I don't know when the first idea of comedy came about. Maybe I tend to be a little sarcastic. Maybe it's the fact that I have to look at myself in the mirror when I shave every morning. So comedy, I guess, is inspired through all of these things. But for me, I, you know, I enjoyed doing comedy, but more like personal things with friends and family. But really a little bit from the pulpit, what we call from the bima to, you know, during sermons. And certainly in the classroom, I was a class clown a bit. But when I came to Savannah, I had never thought about doing stand-up comedy. I was always too, you know, I don't know, shy, too nervous about it. It's hard to stand up in front of people and just do jokes, especially I, I thought when you hear that awful quiet. Where if, when I'm giving a sermon, if the joke doesn't work. I just go into the meaning of the sermon, so it's not such a big deal. But when you stand up there, I think it's uh, it's very it's just you in the emptiness of space. Right. You're all alone if that joke doesn't work, and it's that pause where you're wondering, oh, my goodness, don't forget the next joke. I hope it works better than the last one. And that's the thing. We're all amateur comedians here in Savannah. Some are terrific. Some have just started and are terrific, and some have been doing it a long time, and they're good. Some, you know, but there's different grades of good. Uh, um but you're, you're absolutely right. The first time you step on a stage, I was 69 years old when a friend of mine, Melanie Goldie, who will be on in the future broadcast, she says, Bill, uh, I run a stand-up. Uh, I want you to come and do it. I says, I've never done stand-up in my life. I know, but you're funny. You'll do good. And then I went there to watch it, and then she says, you're going up? I says, no. I says, I just, you know. Uh, I, she says, well, next week come and go up. So she kind of dared me, and I, I wrote stuff together and I got and I went there and then it was my turn to go up and it wasn't a big audience it was a small audience at a um, restaurant that's now out of business so it was a middle of the week and it was a small audience and I thought well, I'll give it a try and uh, I absolutely bombed for five minutes I didn't get a smile never mind a chuckle and um, when I left the stage I just had a big smile on my face and I said I'll be back and I come back the following week, and it, I got a few ripples of laughter that, you know, and I said, that was it. I will, I'm not leaving now. I will not let it beat me. I will figure it out. And in my case, what I had to figure out was I am talking to people in their 20s and 30s mostly that are in a bar room or, or a restaurant at that time of night in the middle of the week. I have no connection with the movies they see, with um, the music they listen to, with anything, with the co comedians they know. No connection whatsoever with people that age. So how do I connect with them? And the easiest way I found out was I made a joke about food and everyone eats. And I thought along that theme from then on, I try to keep it to what everyone's familiar with. And then the age difference disappears. Or I'll just make fun of my age. You know, when I introduce myself as Savannah's only openly old comedian, I, you know, break the ice like, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it, so I hope no one else is not okay with it. But anyway, that's, that's what I do, and you're totally correct. The first time you stand up there, I had butterflies, but I think it helped me being older that I, it wasn't going to ruin me. It wasn't, I wasn't going to leave the stage crying. It was, nothing like that was going to happen. I've been through enough. We all have. And it wasn't going to beat me. And I, I wanted to do it. So once she gave me the encouragement and, you know, once again, I wouldn't have met you. And here we are. Yeah, and it's so much fun. I mean, we have a nice group of people. Everybody gets along. And I think it's, you know, that first time up when you're very nervous and you really just standing up there once you do that then you can do it again and again if you really enjoy it and you know everybody here most or most of them are amateurs and we just do it because we we like to have fun we go to the open mics we get shows once in a while we just enjoy uh, each other's companies but also testing yourself to see is this funny just to me is this funny to everybody else is it funny to my wife um so it really uh you know make and i think comedy you know 
It's for all ages. It doesn't matter what age or where you come from. Comedy is comedy. Unlike you, you know, when we go to the bars at night and do, you know, I'm a big bar hopper. You know, <laughs> I heard. You know, <laughs> if I'm not at a bar at two o'clock in the morning, I'm not me. So I had a distinct advantage over you. But you know, in reality, I don't actually really drink alcohol, and you know, the only bars I go to are now for comedy. But it's kind of cool because I do when somebody comes to town and says, what bar do you want to go to? You know, what should I go to? I said, I, I know like three bars now. It's awesome. Yeah. And they all do comedy yes. and they all welcome me. Yeah, those are the only bars I know in town really, you know. Right. And they, and they do. It's funny. I mean, you just fit right in from the first time you were there. The first time I saw you. I don't know if it was the first time you were there. It was about, how long have you been doing it now? Um, well, I don't know how long. I think a while back. In Savannah? Yeah, I, I, you know, I went to the Sentient Bean one night. I saw it. I always wanted to do it. I was always too nervous. I have friends who are professional comedians uh, in in Israel and in L.A., but, you know, I never thought about it. But I said, I'm going to do it. It's got my bucket list. So I did it. It went pretty well. I did it another place that same night. I said, all right, I've done it. And then an organization in town called CASA, uh, which does Dancing with the Stars every year, decided they were going to do a comedy night fundraiser. And somebody on the board, uh, as a member of my congregation, said, our rabbi is funny. And so, would you like to do it? I said, yeah, I'd love to. Sure, of course, why not? I'll test myself. I didn't realize I had to raise $5,000. So, <laughs> I, so I raised, you know, $6,500, and I did the comedy night for CASA, and I really enjoyed it. I got to, you know, put a whole, you know, 10-minute, 15-minute set. And then after that, over the next six months, I said, you know what? This would be a great way to work on my jokes for high holiday sermons. You know, I, I know what my sermons are about. I need to figure out, put some jokes in it and make it a little bit more warm and welcoming. What better way to test them out? So I started testing out my high holiday sermons. And then eventually, as time went on, I started, you know, I'm really enjoying this. I'll do this as a hobby. I, I saw you grow, too. When you first went up there the first few times, you had your list you kept referring to or your cell phone, where they were, whatever it was. And, and I don't give people advice unless they ask for it. But I said, this guy's so good. I have to say one thing. Once you get rid of that list, you're going to have more confidence up there, and it's going to work better because that looking down at the list takes you out of it and sometimes takes the audience out of it, too. And no matter how good you said is, if you keep referring to a list, you know, it makes a difference. Once you can get rid of those training wheels and you did right away and you know it was uh it made a, a huge difference you were funny but you just went up a level when you did that yeah it's and again it's like anything else it's learning as you go along i you know some people tell stories now i tell stories and sermons but when i go up on stage i usually tell more jokes so mine are boom 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 with a little bit length so i have to know you know what's coming next so it took me a while for the confidence to say if i go up there and i forget three jokes or i don't complete this joke it's going to be okay because i can do it next week and practice it so and that's also great because there's a lot of open mics so you know you go one night and you do a joke and it doesn't work but you know this joke can work if i had changed it just a little bit and then next week you go back and you do the same joke but you change the punchline or redo the way it works and it kills and you're like okay Right. And as you say, there's a lot of open mics. However, when I started, there was pretty much one. And it was Tuesday night, and it moved from the place it closed to uh, Chuck's Bar, where it's been for a couple of years now, two or three years, very successful there. It's a Tuesday night that, that can fill the place up. Yeah, and it's a, it's a lot of fun to go to. I mean, the open mics are great because, again, sometimes you bomb, sometimes you do a great job. I mean, except for you and I, who always you know, kill. We never bomb. We're, we're like, you know, but for normal comedians who are not as amazing <laughs> exemplary examples of comedians like us. You mean my future guests. That's right. <laughs> your future guests. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Plus it's a lot of camaraderie. Plus you learn a lot from how other people do their sets. Um, my wife is a huge comedy fan. So she actually listens online and on, uh, on, on different programs to comedy even more than I do. And so, you know, people love it, but it's great to see how different people do it. It's also great to see that people sometimes do the same jokes because you're repeating, but they make alterations. It's, it's kind of nice. And they'll be doing it in front of different crowds. Right. I may have heard a friend of mine's joke 30 times, but the people listening to it haven't. And that's what you have to remember that, you know, the, the crowd changes every week. It's not the same people you're telling the joke to. Right, unless it's in your house to your wife, then they don't want to hear the joke 30 times. I, know Just, that I learned that story. recently. 
I have a patient wife. She's <laughs> fabulous. She supports me, whatever I do. Honestly, and I know April's the same way for you. Oh, she's, she's, I mean, she's so supportive. It's been really fabulous. Before I go too far, I would just like to wish you, a, as being a very future, very short future father, happy Father's Day. Thank you very much. Yes, my wife is pregnant, so we're looking forward to having our first kid. I'm looking forward to having my first kid mostly just for the jokes, because <laughs> I hear so many people with these jokes about kids, I can't do it yet, but now now I can. Oh, and uh, trust me, you'll have, you'll have a basket full in no time at all. The kids are a riot. They really are, and especially when they start talking and you hear what's, what their brain is thinking. Wow. It's it's going to be amazing, and so and my wife actually is really funny too. She actually uh, did a stand up. She's done it twice. Once she did it because she wanted to do it. Once she did it when her mom came in town. And I saw her. Hel- yeah, she was hilarious. I was there. I thought she was terrific. Yeah, she doesn't want to do it anymore, but uh, she is. She's definitely the funniest person in our house. Yeah, that's you know. As I, I say the same thing about Marianne too, because she can crack me up. I will say something as dead serious, you know, and I'm, and she just throws it over and says, do you realize what you just said? And then I have to think about it, and that's terrible. She holds up a mirror to me, like, did you realize what you just said? Or she'll throw some little quip in there. I said, Marianne, why am I doing stand-up? You're the funny one in this house. No, I couldn't do it. I said, you do it well with me. And the same with April. So my, so my, I have some a couple jokes that are just kill every time, and almost all of them come from her. I mean, she says something in the house, and then she'll fix something. She says, and it's, it's really, uh, and it's a great hobby. I mean, it's so much fun. You can go do it uh, anytime. The, um, okay, uh, let's see what I was going to say about mm, comedy. Where was I? I lost my train. Sorry there. Going to hop back on it. Um, anyway, having someone support you is a huge difference. It really is. I could go home and think something's funny, but if I don't have anyone to bounce it off, and this is what I came up with as far as Marianne, and she can, she could take a joke as well as anyone. I say, I would try a new joke on her. If she says that's awful, I use it. <laughs> <laughs> if she says that's great and laughs, I use it. But she goes, mm, it might need some work. I won't use it because she's right on that. But we have a different sense of humor, so if she thinks it's awful, I know it's great, and I run with it. And usually, usually I'm right that it was great, but if it isn't, then I have to come home and say, well, you know, guess who was right again? Not me as your first guess. Well, I think it's great to have April, but I think it's also nice that, you know, at first when you go up, you want to really do well every single time, so you tend to use the jokes that you know are funny mm-hmm. and make subtle changes, but as time goes on, you realize, okay, I've been doing this one a lot. I need an entirely new set. Maybe I'll use one or two old ones. I, there's a wonderful comedian who lives in this area named Colin Moulton who, who taught me that. You know, you kind of use a couple of the ones you really know really well, but then keep trying new stuff because it really... Oh, absolutely. You have to add more to the part. And, absolutely. And you have to be willing to know that it may not work. You know, you know you have some jokes that everybody will laugh at, and it's a completely new audience, but you have to really have the gusto to try completely new stuff, even if you're not sure it's going to be funny. And it's, and it's funny. If you say something and, it's, and you don't get a laugh... Most of the time, it's not funny. However, there are times I know it's good. It's the wrong audience. Sometimes it's just the wrong audience, and I'll just stop, and I'll, if I, I'll laugh about it myself for a few seconds, and then I'll look up and I'll say, guess I hit too close to home on that one, huh? <laughs> and then move on to the next one. You can't let it throw you. It's like, you know, oh, well. That's, and in my case, it's always the audience's fault that it's not funny <laughs> because the joke obviously has to be funny if I wrote it. But, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's again, it's, it's a real confidence builder. When you can stand up there and know it's not going well, but you still do it, and then you go back up again, it tests you to write new Absolutely. material all the time. Yeah. It tests you to take your material in different places, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly, sometimes really basically. But it's really, uh, it's, it's so much fun, and I've really enjoyed it. And plus, the camaraderie is great. I think I know the answer to this question before I even ask it. But, um, well, you said, you know, and, and Jewish humor is famous. I mean, you could go on naming some of the best Jewish comedians. And some of them, you know, well, oh, gee, they're Jewish, didn't know. It doesn't matter. But, they, you know, they have a great. But was there any, has there been anyone that come up to you at, at your congregation and said, I don't think you should be doing that? Anyone uh, 
discourage you at all? Not in my congregation. Good. I have a great congregation. I do it, you know, on a weekday night. Right. So it's uh, it's really great. I think it's, you know, very traditional in many respects for rabbis to be comedians. There are several famous rabbis who became comedians. I- I'm glad. That's, you know, it's the way it should be. And right. I, I, as I said, I knew the answer to the question. but And plus just... my comedy is clean. I'm, I'm, you know, in many respects kind of like the Michael Jordan of clean comedy. Because... <laughs> You know, when I when we first far started, you know, there was very few clean comics. Now there's a lot of them out there, so it's a kind of mix and match. But, uh, you know, for me, it's always testing how can, you know, make sure it's clean, family-friendly for anybody of any age. I am not at your level, but I pretty much always do a clean set. I don't use foul language. I don't think it's necessary for myself. I never knock anyone else how they get a laugh. If they want to do it, fine. And some of them think, I'm a prude for not doing it. But it's, I just thought I would challenge myself. If I don't do that, I'm going to have to work harder. To make an adult crowd in a bar room laugh is um, unbelievable if you can do that without going, as I say, in that direction. And that's just a great feeling. And when you, when you do that, for me, I won. That was what I wanted to do, and that's what I do, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I went in that direction. I didn't have to. I've heard the words. I just, you know, I don't want to do it. So anyway, that's how I feel about that. But whatever anyone does is comedy. If they get a laugh, good luck to them, and I always wish them well. I, I agree. I mean, everybody has to find their own way. You know, Lenny Bruce was a very famous Jewish comedian in the 60s who tested all the, the boundaries, and so do others. But everybody kind of finds their own you know, their and own he tested them with jail sentences. Yeah, he, he he did it at a whole different time period than we are today. And I think one of the things that you see that a lot of the Jewish communities in the early 20th century kind of brought to the world was the idea that you can make fun of yourself. And that is really where a lot of comedians go. It's they make fun of themselves or their own community or their own ethnicities or their own yeah. religions. Yeah. You know, it's make fun of what you know. Yeah, and, and no, that's the key thing there. Talk about what you know. You might, you know, go to a movie and say, oh, that scene was funny, and then you try to do something like that, but it, you don't know it. You really don't know it. Use your own life or people you met or, you know, people you know, experiences that happen to you, and I, I think you're, you're better off. And as far as remember when I said when you go up there, and I did the same thing. I had a card, and I'd put it down on the table and refer to it as to what the next joke was. But... um you know, I, I, I couldn't get off that quick enough because I said, this isn't going anywhere. As soon as I looked down to that card, I looked up and all of a sudden the ones that were looking at you now are looking at their cell phones and doing something else. So I said, that's, it's important to do that. Um, so, as I said, you started off a little kid. Now, honestly, did, were your parents okay with your humor or did you have to be called in line? Okay, that's not funny. Did you ever hear that? I mean, you know, just normal kids. My mother did not understand my humor at all. I think towards my 20s, she started to understand if I told a joke, if I'd said something sarcastic to her, she understood finally that I was saying something sarcastically. But yeah, she never understood it at all. My dad had a very dry wit, so I think he understood it. But you know, I was I was definitely very funny, at least in, in class and stuff. But I was not like, you know, a stand-up comedian type person. I was funny with the friends and such mm-hmm. forth, but you know, it's when you go on stage it's a whole different level. But again, you know, being Jewish, you know, it seems like everybody is knows a comedian or knows somebody who's in the, the comedy business. So I worked at a camp and several of the people there who were who were counselors with me went on to be professional comedians or very good amateurs. So you saw it all over the place. It's really quite inspiring. It's it's uh you know, it's funny to also note that some of the really funny comedians aren't that funny in person. You know, they're they're more subdued in person. It's not till they get on stage. Stage persona. Yeah, and then you really become the funny person, and I think a lot of them are like that. I heard Johnny Carson was like that. At a party, he was dull, dry, didn't talk to many people, and just kind of stayed in the corner. It, yeah, when and I when look I at it, he could talk to anyone about anything, anytime, and come out with a quip real right. fast that you could tell was off the cuff. And yet, uh, you know, that was not his life. Yeah, and again, whenever I went out with him, he was always really subdued and, you know, relaxed. And Well, he didn't pick up the check when I went out with him. He did for me. <laughs> I figured. I think our relationship was a little bit tighter than yours. Okay, I'd like to um, have to make a underwriting announcement now and a 
Uh, let's see if I go over here and a double. Hit it again. This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by a grant from Sentient Bean, offering fair trade coffee, vegan and vegetarian food, and breakfast all day. Located at 13 East Park Avenue, across the street from the tennis courts at Forsyth Park. Our menu and special events listings can be found at sentientbean.com. Okay, we're back now. Um, and as I said earlier, this is Bill Cooper. I'm here with my guest tonight, Rabbi Robert Haas. And this is the first issue of what I'm going to call, the name of the show is Savannah at Night. And we will be bringing you people from the Savannah area that are involved in the arts, anything to do with the arts. Music, pretty much, I'll stay away from. They do have other shows here that um, present local musicians and that. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, but uh, it'll be tonight. I have a. <laughs> okay, well, a little background thing going on here. I, I'm back with you. So that's what it will be about. It'll be bringing you people that are loaded with talent in this city, and it's at the. I, I really hope that you get out and to see some of the things that are going on in this city. I know some of my neighbors and friends never come downtown. And I'm amazed. I mean, I have been, um, you know, if there's a play that I'm not in, I'll go see it. If there's something good, you know, musicians come into town, you go see them, whatever. And I can't believe you can just sit in front of a television all your life and not go and see what's going on live, in person, in your city. And if, if I can encourage you to get out and see some of the thing and meet some of the people that we're talking to and about here... I think you're going to enjoy it. Anyway, back to you, Rabbi. Rabbi Robert, my friend, my neighbor. Um, so, you're, as I say, you're going to be a dad soon, and you're going to find out that, one, as I say, once a daughter, right? You, a you daughter, say, yes. Once your daughter comes and she can talk and, you, and she expresses herself, you're going to find some f f great material. Oh, I look forward to it. It's about the first Haas girl in almost 100 years. Uh, you had said that. That's amazing. Yeah, so wow. we're very excited about it. My mother-in-law is especially excited about it, so she'll be here uh, a lot, which is great because I really love my mother-in-law. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to the family life. We'll see if I can still do comedy. I think I'll try and do as much as possible, be a little less than I've been doing it. We may have to do it in your front room. <laughs> that would, you're, you're all welcome. That would be cool. And, uh, yeah, and I, th I think uh, just doing comedy in Savannah is indicative a little bit about how Savannah is. It's very welcoming. There's a lot of interfaith stuff going on, people getting along with each other. You don't see a lot of heckling. You know, I've only been heckled once, and you almost never see it in any of the comedy shows. I think it's, uh, it's a really nice place with a lot going on. And I think you said it. There's, there's plays. There's music. There's films with SCAD. There's always some sort of thing going on in the park. There's always an event. This is a vibrant city. It's really hard to believe that there's maybe 150,000 people in the city, but there's so much going on, and it's really quite an incredible feeling to be part of it. One of the reasons we moved down here, my wife and I came down from Massachusetts 17 years ago. My son was stationed here in the Army at Hunter, and when I first visited, I said, this would be a great place to retire to. So then I f had to convince my wife she'd be as happy as here as I would. And no, she said, you know what, if it doesn't work out, we can always move back. Well, that was 17 years ago. And one of the things that really attracted me was SCAD. I, I said, I have to find some connection to SCAD. I thought it was a great, it was a growing art school. You could see the architecture in this city, the buildings they saved and preserved and, uh, you know, used for for either student rooms or, or whatever, that they, they've done a great thing in the city and really infused money into it in the process. But I wanted to have some kind of connection with it. So at first I volunteered. I was the SCAD's first volunteer ever, and I did that for a year. And then I found out about the films, and so I, I got into that, and I've acted in, oh, I, I've, I'm, 
I lost count, but I think it's about 45 student films. Some of them are terrific. Yeah, some I've of seen them, a couple of them with you and other people. Yeah, fabulous. some of them um, have won awards in different um, shows that brought them to in there. And these kids are training for the real deal. They want to be in Hollywood or Bollywood or wherever they go or New York City. And uh, this is the real deal. They take it very serious. They're great young people to be around. They're very respectful. And as I say, I like the part where they take their job so serious that if someone needs a piece of equipment when they're filming something, he'll turn around and say it once, whoever it is, the director, the producer will turn around, I need this, three people will run for it. It's not like, oh, you get it, now it's your turn. I mean, they really are committed to what they do, and it's just nice to be around people like that. It's so easy to put a generation down, and I, I never understood that. I'm stop it. We were all young. We were the smartest people on earth when we were young, and then we have to move on, and smarter people than us come by, and that's the way it is. Don't, you know, don't put them down because they're different. Of course they're different. We don't want them to be like us. That's how you evolve. That's how you change. Get rid of the bad, keep the good, and move on. But I just want to say I, I can't say enough uh, uh, what a good experience I had working with these young people at SCAD, and I look forward to it every time I do it. And yet, uh, we have a lot of the SCAD students who come through the synagogue for various things. I just got to sit on a thesis committee. Really terrific kids. I only hear positive things about them, really have really enlivened the city, especially downtown. And it's really, I know there's a Jewish group uh, for SCAD, uh, it's a Jewish Hillel, the organization uh, for college kids who are Jewish, the advisors, a member of our congregation. So yeah, I think it's really helped to enliven, invigorate, and just make the city even more so. I mean, it's a southern town, so we have that southern, cool, southern quality, but then we've got the new vibe with all these hip kids in the town, and then, you know, it just makes it all work. And the SCAD um, goes out of their way to get students from foreign countries to come here. And what they said was that we want to learn, we want them to learn from us, and we want to learn from them. And it really is great. I can't tell you how many different nationalities of young people I worked with on sets. And once again, the 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 enthusiasm was just uh, amazing. That you know, it's just nice to see. And as I say, young people, nice going, keep going, keep keep doing the right thing, and you are. Yeah, and I think you see a lot of that all around the city. Just programs and activities and things all around and for instance you mentioned comedy earlier you said you started there was one open mic night there's an open mic now every monday every tuesday wednesday. every wednesday most thursdays some fridays and on saturdays there's usually shows you have shows all over the place some of the comedians from this area they bring in comedians from atlanta a uh, friend of mine, Colin Mullen, I mentioned he does a show on Tybee, and he does one at, uh, at a coffee shop in Wilmington. I, I mean, it's just so many things just in the comedy world. And then you go to the, uh, you know, go to the theater, and they have a new theater group in town, and, you know, it's just mm -hmm. booming. And fa speaking of that show you did in Tybee, I'm there with Mary Ann, and I'm sitting there watching you. And you were terrific, as always. You were terrific, but I'm saying... I told him that he shouldn't look at his notes, and there he is up there, and I'm paying to see him. I guess I was a pretty good teacher. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun to open. I've done it a couple of times now, open for professional comedians, and you learn so much about the difference you know, between doing it professionally. You really have to work it. you got to go travel. from. I have a friend who's a comedian in L.A. He doesn't make money in L.A. because you do comedy for free in L.A. He has to travel around the globe. All around the country, all around, yeah. going to Israel a lot. You know, if you're a professional comedian, so I meet some of these people, and they are so dedicated. They have to have their websites. They have to have, you know, just really be working it all the time. But you hear them when they stand there, and they can go for 45 minutes or an hour straight just telling stories and just being funny the whole time. It's really, really quite impressive. I did 42-minute set one time, and it didn't even seem like it because it was working so good. And it was just, uh, you know, I didn't know if I could do it. The most I had ever done was 10 minutes. But I actually went, and they said, do a half hour. Well, it was 12 minutes over by the time I got off. And it didn't even seem like I had done the half hour. I was amazed. There was no light. Nobody, there was, no one gave you the light. It was just, you know, go till you're done. And it was. Well, you've been doing it a long time, so you have a lot of material. So it's really about putting it together, keeping it going. If right. there's a lull, how do you break the lull? How do you tell the story and you know, instead of getting one joke out of the story, how do you get five jokes out of the story, which is something I'm having trouble with and working on. And um, But it's amazing to see, you know, professionals and 
they do it so often you know when your livelihood is dependent upon you being funny yep. it's a whole different level you know i have a, a job which i love and adore my congregation so but uh, what they have to do is pretty 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 impressive i have um i tell people take notes i i'm old-fashioned i i use the pencil and a, and a notepad if something hits me funny i'll just write one or two words about it then when i get home i hope i remember what was funny about those two words but you know i'll just do it in a hurry but every set i've done and i've done an average of probably um every week and a half i'll do at least one one appearance somewhere so may you know so maybe 40 times a year and i've been doing it now going on five years so there's 200 times i have kept those notes from from my set each set i kept it finally i get tired of looking at the paper piling up and i decided to put it into some kind of an order and i was amazed how much stuff i had come up with because you know we this is all our own stuff we don't we don't take something off the internet we don't take some joke we've heard 10 years ago this is all stuff we're making up. I was amazed. I amazed myself how much stuff I had come up with in all that time. And I was saying, wow. And when you see it in front of you in person, that's what does it. Um, okay, you talk about um, your temple. Please tell some of the people, get a couple of minutes on some of the history of that temple. That is amazing. Yeah, and one of the wonderful things about Savannah, of course, is the history. And my congregation, Congregation of Israel, is the second oldest religious institution in the state and the third oldest synagogue in America. Uh, founded in 1733, about five months after Oglethorpe founded this colony, a group of Jews, mostly refugees from Portugal coming through England came here and uh, there happened to be a yellow fever epidemic and on the boat happened to be a very renowned doctor, a Jewish doctor, hard to believe, what my mom always hoped I would be, but never was. And in t exchange for him treating the community, the Jews were welcomed here and have had full rights ever since the beginning of this state. It's, I think, one of the only, co first, maybe the only of the 13 colonies in which Jews have had full rights from the beginning. And so since we've been here since 1733, we've always been part of the community. So usually in a town this size in the South, you're not gonna see that many Jews, maybe a few hundred, but we have probably around 4,500. So we have a thriving Jewish community. We have three synagogues. We have a Jewish community center and a, and a federation. And there's a lot going on. And our congregation is downtown because of course it's a historic building as well. And we get, you know, probably last year, maybe 16,000 tourists coming for tours or coming to services. But we do also a lot with the community because we've been here so long and we get along with everybody somewhere. You know, I do a lot with here with the UU, with uh, uh, Reverend Messner, who's a good friend of mine. And it's, you know, a beautiful thing to see people coming together in the city to work for the betterment. I always say giving is getting. You know, you get so much out of giving. You know, if you, you help someone to help something, you're certainly a great example about it. We're going to be wrapping it up now. As a reminder, you've been listening to Savannah at Night, your host, Bill Cooper, and my very special first guest, Rabbi Robert Haas. And uh, if you're a struggling comedian out there, just remember, keep notes, keep notes. You'll be amazing if you look back after a couple of years, some of the stuff you have that's still good. Anyway, thank you very much, Rabbi. I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming. It's been an honor having you here. Thank you very much, and it was a true honor being your first guest. Everybody thinks the world of you, Bill, and we know this is going to be an amazing show. I can't wait to keep listening to it every Sunday. I didn't think I could blush on a radio. <laughs> anyway, once again, thank you, and uh, um, I'd like to say we are WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with